And welcome everybody, what a crowd. Um, the, these fireside chats are pretty successful. Uh, as Nat said, this is our third in the series. And today, Ralphine Locke is our guest of honor. Welcome, Ralphine. <laughs> now, Ralphine needs no introduction in this audience. Uh, I think everybody knows Ralphine. She's a great community supporter. Uh, she loves BAM, she loves the history, and today she's going to tell us some of her tales of the early days here in BAM. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Ralphine. So, uh, you're a local. You were born here. No, I was born at Lake Louise. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> you know, I was born in a little log cabin at Lake Louise. Yeah, you were. <laughs> right on the lake. Well, at least right behind the chateau. Uh, yeah. There were other previous children uh, born at the station, but uh, I was the, apparently the first, according to Uncle Tom Wilson, who was uh, a relative by marriage, uh, and uh, he was a, a great old guy. I knew him well, and I really enjoyed him when he was around town. And why, why, why were you born at Lake Louise? Why well, would you be born up there? Well, my <laughs> I mean, it's... Yeah, it's got to be a reason. There's no hospital there. <laughs> no, no, but uh, my dad was the uh, superintendent for the Brewster Transport Company, and uh, he was stationed at Lake Louise in the summers to run that part of the operation. So we, the family moved up to this little log cabin in the middle of the Rouge de compound out there, all with horses and buses and <laughs> all that stuff all around us. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, quite a good start <laughs> for me. Uh, um, my dad used to say I was born in the barn. I wasn't quite. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of backfired when I was in grade two at school. The Christmas story was being told. And I put up my hand, teacher, I was born on a, in a barn too. Embarrassing moments. Oh yeah, well, anyway. that's, that, that's great. And now, now your mother is a Brewster? And she, yes, she's a cousin of the, what we call the Bant Brewsters. The family, oh. Uncle Johnny's family that settled here. And he was, the, my grandfather was the first of the four brothers that came to Banff in the uh, 1880s. And that was James Irvin? James Irvin, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And uh, since then, every generation has at least two or three James Irvins in it. So it makes it very uh, complicated to keep track of it all. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've been trying to figure it out. Yeah. But it's, uh, I don't know whether it would have to say uh, James Senior or what, <laughs> but anyway. And you were uh, also a McDou McDougal, too. Yes, my mother was. <laughs> Part of the, my grandmother was part of the McDougal, the McDougal family, and she came to the, the Bow Valley in the 1880s. Okay. Uh, in 1880, exactly. She, okay. Yeah, came up the uh, Missouri <coughs> River in a certain wheeler and to help with the mission at Morley. Okay. So, okay. And they met at Morley, and uh, my grandpa, my grandma, and uh, the rest is history in that respect. <laughs> now, now, James Brewster, why, why did he come up? What did he do when he came Oh, here? well, he, um, he came up when he was about 17 from Kingston. And um, he got a job uh, traffic, uh, uh, transporting goods from Winnipeg to Edmonton. And, you know, at that time there wasn't a single bridge between here and Winnipeg. And it was hard going, but he made it, and <laughs> very colorful stories out of that. But uh, so anyway, he uh, got uh, involved with the survey for the railway, right? Uh, and so he spent a lot of time in this valley. Yes, and he 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 was cutting ties with the yeah, railway. Yeah, he guy? got a contract to cut ties for the railway okay. uh, up this, the the uh, Sundance area, Are and there's still the odd, uh, you know. A sign of, of that early. Yes, those li those those derelict cabins just beyond Sundance Lodge. Yeah. There, uh, are those cabins that that he would have built. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th and that was what 18, 
81, yes, 82? Yes, 81, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And now there's a relationship with Tom Wilson, too. You, yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom was uh, hired to uh, be the lead on the uh, 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 finding people to, to steer them through the Rockies when they were trying to find a route for the CPR. And uh, Tom had some great stories to tell about getting through the Kicking Horse Canyon in those days, you know, with no, no trail. <laughs> and uh, it, it was great to talk, hear him talk about all this. But uh, he was assigned to corral some um, native Indians who knew their country. And uh, they put a group together, and Major Rogers led the way, and uh, that's a good story too. And incidentally, if you've read The National Dream by Pierre Burton, there's a lot about Tom Wilson in that, and he, he was quite an outstanding man. Um, very, very tough. <laughs> you know, he could tackle anything. Yeah. So, yeah and there's a picture, guy. actually, uh, afterwards, if you want to come up here and look, uh, there's a photograph of Ralphine as a child with Tom Wilson and with... Uh, Elizabeth McDougall. Elizabeth McDougall. John McDougall. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you yeah. called Tom Uncle Tom and you called Jim Brewster Uncle Jim and yeah. and uh, yeah and Uncle Bill and so on and Uncle yeah. Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill Uncle, Uncle Bill Pat. built the bridge the <laughs> the first bridge did he no that's the older Uncle Bill that's the older I, Uncle I'm Bill I'm talking about <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> well you know you can't invent <laughs> any new names <laughs> you can't keep straight. oh geez. No, it's very tough okay yeah. anyways you come from a good a good a good line <laughs> a good line. But uh, so, so you went. To, you were born at Lake Louise, and you spent your summers there. Yeah, I mm -hmm. guess because it closed up in the winter. And that's days. right. Yeah. yeah so, did. so what did what did what did you do as a child at Lake Louise? Well, we did a lot of. Um, my dad loved to drive, and we were always on the road somewhere. You know, to Marine Lake or Emerald Lake or you know somewhere, uh, yeah. touring the country and getting to know it really well, and. Um, um, we, of course, we really enjoyed that whole area, and I really learned to love nature. <laughs> mm. And uh, we, we used to go for lots of wonderful walks in that area and along horse the riding? lake. And, and yeah, I was on a horse when I was two years old, and I got a picture of it here for me. <laughs> but yeah, the horses were big in those days, mm. and uh, uh, our family used to take off, and yeah, I'd be. <laughs> along there, but uh, did quite a lot of riding around there. And it was a nice way to connect with the tourists at that time because uh, we always had horse rides up to Plains Six Glaciers or uh, the, the Lakes in the Clouds, as we called them then. And uh, so we'd meet some wonderful people and they were always interested to think that anybody would really live in the Rockies in the winter, you know, <laughs> the full time. Yeah, and then later, you no, know, you only spent your early summers yeah. mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in yeah, Lake Yeah, and then Louise. Dad was made uh, overall superintendent of the company, so we came back to Banff full time. Yeah. But uh, periodically, I spent a summer up at Lake Louise yeah. until uh, we moved back to, you know, after the war. Yeah. Or during yeah. the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and so what was it like back here in Banff? So this is... Depression, 1930s. Yeah, but yeah. it was a busy little town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, there was quite a lot going on. It was interesting because, you know, the, the Depression had really hit Banff hard. And uh, people, you know, just, did it. and with our long, quiet winters, I mean, Banff was so quiet in the winter then because before the skiing started. And so, um, uh, you know, he would get pretty depressed sometimes, but I used to sit around the well, hotel a lot because uh, we were always welcome there. In fact, we lived there periodically from time to time, and uh, uh, Uncle Jim would be talk collecting a group of people, to, you know, that just dropped in because it was a beautiful, welcoming lobby there, mm -hmm. and you know, it was full of beautiful mountain paintings and. Uh, animal heads and 
about bear skins and, or, and a blazing fireplace, and it was just a very welcoming place. And I can remember hearing conversations with people like uh, Tom Wilson and uh, um, uh, oh, Strom, of course. Strom, yeah. Strom would have been there. Erling Strom, he was planning, in spite of the, you know, the downturn, he, they were all planning to expansions. And uh, Erling was starting to build a Cinnabine, and uh, Jim Brewster was starting to build Sunshine, and uh, um, one of the white boys, it'd be uh, hmm. Cliff. Cliff, yeah, Cliff, would, uh, was uh, working with Sir Norman Watson to build Skokie. Right. And it was doing very well. So, yes. so there's a whole new concept opening up there. And, uh, you know, I think it's really remarkable these people had the plain guts to do it because it wasn't easy. You know? Well, it, it is surprising that the birth of skiing in this part of the world was during the Depression. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That rather yeah. than saying, oh my goodness, woe is me, they actually started new businesses. Yeah, and I give a lot of credit to Jim Rooster for that. He really had a vision, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he uh, was, you know, a leader in those kinds of things. And his brother Bill, and uh, they made a big impact on the town. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I really give a lot of credit, too, to uh, some of the people that worked on the trail, you know, making these things happen, because, uh, you know, they're just cowboys, and they come in from, usually from ranches around and so on, and work, and uh, they were so resourceful. You know, they were just amazing, and would not stop at any kind of hurdle. <laughs> And a good example was that and they, when they were building Sunshine, they uh, had a, this was 1935 and six. they um, had to move in a, a big uh, restaurant stove, solid iron, and uh, how to get that in on the pony trail with 2200 altitude gain and uh, just the just pony trail to do it. So they took it all apart, mm -hmm. and they loaded it onto horses. Mm -hmm. And if any of you have ever tried to load a heavy article onto a horse <laughs> pack, uh, it, you know that it's not easy. Yeah. And I guess the, the air was pretty blue with some uh, I'll bet it was. fancy cussing I'll in those days. I'll bet it was. Yeah. But there was yeah. still a few tourists coming. In those during the depression, and and they would yeah. they would during the depression they were they would arrive on the train. Yeah. Now you told me that there were sometimes seven trains arriving. Yeah, believe a day. it or not, passenger trains. Yeah. Alive, arriving. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. was one of my dad's jobs is to meet every train, so he just kept busy. <laughs> oh, and he was there with the automobiles to take them. Yeah, to make sure everything went well, and sometimes yeah. there'd be some pretty important people on them. And, right. You know, they'd be well received, so. You were talking about the siding. They had a special siding there for special yes. cars. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, where yeah. they could pull movie stars and yeah. royalty mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. off. And some of the big wigs of the CPR yeah. would come, you know, yeah. and yeah. so on. So they had special privileges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had my first drink of um, ginger ale in one of those cars. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. We okay. were invited down to Mr. Jameson, who was uh, one of the prominent ones in, and uh, had my first ginger ale. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a nice memory. And then yeah. the tourists would get into your dad's uh, All cars. Oh, the conveyances, yeah, the conveyances, buses, and, yeah. And they'd come up yes, along right Lake Street? Up, yeah, Lake Street, right, this next street here. And uh, it was the most direct route to the Banff Springs and the, the pontoon bridge that was built then to handle the traffic across there. And also the um, Breton Sanitarium was being built there too, and that attracted a lot of people for the healing waters of the... And who, whose sanitarium was that? Dr. Brett. Dr. Brett. Who be, later became uh, Lieutenant Governor of Alberta. But he was a railway uh, doctor originally, and then he, heard about the, the qualities of the sulfur waters, so 
you build a great business from that. Right, yeah. right. And, and it, it was where the administration building That's is right. now? That's yeah. right, yeah. 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 And we watched the old sanitarium burn down from the, the top of the Mount Royal Hotel <laughs> when I was okay. about seven. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a good fire. That was a good fire. Yeah. 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 Good, good. And, uh, and then you were telling me about um, the regatta on the river. Oh, yes. Summertime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, well, well on the, it, wasn't, it was earlier, wasn't it? Uh, on, on May 24th. Yes, it yeah. was on May 24th. And uh, sometimes it could be snowing, as we all know. <laughs> but they went ahead anyway. And uh, yeah, they had it consecutively for many years. And uh, they'd have a full fleet of you know, boats and, um, and several races that and the townspeople um, gave them trophies and so on. And uh, there'd be lots of bunting and flags and things all over Bow Avenue right out here. It was right out here, <laughs> which is kind of fun to think it, of it, it now. It, yeah, yeah. And there was a boat rental business there? Yes. Uh, the, the two brothers called Mather came from England, and they started the boathouse. And uh, they had a little launch on the river, mm -hmm. which is mechanized. So it had eventually the parks closed it down because yeah. they felt it was polluting the river. But uh, for many years, it was a big thing in Banff. And we'd go out the river a couple of miles, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, have a little stop break and uh, come back down. And it was really lovely. And it used to go from Mathers, and it used to stop just over here. Wasn't the North Landing just yep, over here? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It used to pick up and let off people at the North Landing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it was a little more convenient for yeah. some of the motels at yeah. that point. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then also May twenty fourth was a special day for Brewsters too. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. That's the day the yellow cars and buses came out and told us it was spring. <laughs> okay. And where, where did they do that? Uh, well, they, it, they all over town, you know, it, it just it dispersed. The season was opening up, and that was yeah. sort of the signal because we think, aha, it is spring, it is happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, all, they were all yellow packards, the touring cars, and the white buses, uh, so-called white, they were yellow too, but it was quite a show. <laughs> <laughs> They were made by the white company, white company in Winnipeg. Oh, 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 okay, okay. And, uh, um, oh, I'm losing <laughs> my train of thought here. Yeah. Um, and then the zoo. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was just top of the street here. And it was a big attraction, for, especially for us kids. They had a polar bear, which came from Cambridge Bay. Cambridge Bay? Cambridge Bay, yeah. And he was called Buddy. And he used to perform. And he had a ball in his uh, cage. And you know, when people were around, he'd uh, play with his ball. And of course, the kids absolutely loved it. <laughs> but they also had uh, a lot of pandanimals. animals. They had coyotes. and bear and cougar and all just, well, it's very, very close to here. And just uh, around where the Central Park is now, mm -hmm. and the gazebo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, they finally took it, uh, the park's policy changed, and they decided they shouldn't have any more um, fenced animals. And so eventually the buffalo were taken out as well. but. Uh, down to where the buffalo were, if you remember, um, there were also um, yak mm -hmm. and uh, many species of sheep, and uh, it was quite an active area too. But that too was eliminated. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. now we got the promise of buffalo in the wild. Right, and you're very active with that. That's yes. the, the mm -hmm. bison belong. Yeah, that's right, and yeah. it's an initiative the uh, Elder and Election Historical Foundation, uh, right. which uh, I serve on the board of, and so does Terry over there. <laughs> oh, good, 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 so, good. And of course, the, the big summer event was Indian Days. Yes, yes. It was really great, and it brought an awful lot of tourists to, 
to a bath. It right. was very popular. Right. Right. And uh, they'd have, a, they camped, they set the teepees up in a circle down just um, where the, uh, close for to where the, uh, at, which is the landing is for planes now yeah. in that yeah. area. And uh, they w the tents all, you know, they rightly painted the teepees, I should say, and uh, with the stories of their their history uh, on each tent or each teepee, and uh, we could go down and visit with the people and so on. And then they had a parade up over the bridge to the Van Springs, mm -hmm. and it was judged for its costumes, and the costumes were amazing. Even the horses were decorated with beadwork, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the bridles and saddles and everything, mm -hmm. very colorful. And yeah. the whole family should be in all decked up. And, and they used to have contests? Yes, or? they had a contest for the best uh, costumes. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they got up to the Bat Springs and they were, the prizes were presented there. Okay. Yeah. And did, did they put on a show at the Bam Springs? Was there a in bit the of evening. That? In yeah. the evening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 They had a, a small grandstand uh, uh, near the tennis court in that area. Yeah. And uh, we used to go up and they encouraged you to partake in the, the dances, you know, especially the round dance. And mm -hmm. did all their traditional dances, which were very complicated and beautiful. But yeah, it was a special time. And you know we would be visiting. One of the highlights was seeing some old friends who had been friends with the Rusher family through the generations. Right. So that was very special. Right. Right. Yeah. A lot of a, a close relationship in those days between the band oh, residents yes. and, yeah. mm -hmm. and the Morley, mm -hmm. the Morley people. Mm -hmm. And also with Cochrane too, there was a close relationship yes, between yes, Banff and Cochrane. There was, days. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of movement back and forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And a lot of uh, young Indian men worked for the company in those early days. Yeah. yeah. We have a, a net Brewster here who is, uh, uh, her family is descended from Bill Brewster, the older brother of Jim. And uh, he started a dairy here. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, two kids became pretty uh, familiar with the mountains. They, they, uh, there was an old Indian named Tom. No, William. No, William Twin. William Twin. William Twin sorry. Yeah, and uh, he showed the kids where all the good fishing was. So uh, one time when the Van Springs couldn't find anybody to take these hired fishermen out, they. The kids, he called, they called the kids because they knew <laughs> it would work. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the Brewster Transport Company That's to right. develop from that. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And did, uh, were you old enough to ride your bicycle? You were talking about kids trading their bikes yeah, for I horses. Wasn't, no. no, you wouldn't no. have been old enough no. for that no. by then. Well, I, I didn't have a bike until I was 12 or something. Oh, you were 12. <laughs> you know, that was depression time, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. the kids used to trade their bikes for rides on the horses. And yeah. it worked very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the Indian kids and the white kids were just yeah. happy as could be. And you, did you know uh, Chief Walking Buffalo? Did you ever meet yeah. him? Well, I did meet him, and he was a, a marvelous old man. He, he just, very, very special. You know, you just knew that he was someone who really had it all together, mm -hmm. and he was a wonderful leader. And when he was in his late 70s, he went around the world on the tour by moral rearmament. It was a group from England who were trying to encourage, especially the native peoples of the world, to um, become more interested in, well, basically Christianity, I guess, but they weren't out preaching, they were just trying to, this moral thing was what they were working on. And uh, so he, he was, went to, you know, to all the aboriginals in Australia, and, and then in Africa, and mm -hmm. yeah, it was a terrific trip. And he came back and still around for a while. So. Yeah, uh, McLean, his name was? Yeah, he, yeah. 
George, John George of Green. George McLean. Uh -huh. Yeah. He was yeah. raised by uh, a missionary. Hmm? He was raised by a missionary. Oh, was he? Yeah. Okay. So, and he, uh, uh, I don't think he was a, I don't think he took out the ministry, but he was just a very, very strong leader for the people and a good example. Yeah. And, you know, he's always decked out with this gorgeous buffalo yeah. horns. You've probably all seen pictures of it. And, you know, it's just very special. Yeah, yeah. There, that's part of the uh, the Gateway exhibit over in the museum. Yes, I it think. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We haven't talked, you're, you, we haven't talked about Eleanor Luxton yet. No. Because you, you went, you were going to school about this time, and Eleanor was your teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was an English teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that she was very important in your life, I think. Oh yeah, well she was a, a relative. I, a know, oh, was she? <laughs> oh yeah, everybody in the country. It was a small town in those well, days. Well, it was a small percentage of white people. You know, I, I've got so many relatives. It's just <laughs> pathetic, <laughs> anyway. But uh, yeah, Ellen there was uh, the daughter of the only daughter of Norman Luxton, who was a very strong character in the Vamp scene. Uh, he was a great adventurer, stopped at nothing. Like he and an uh, old sea captain went across the Pacific in 1901 uh, in a dugout canoe adapted with sails. It's a heck of a story. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, he just was that type of guy. Then later on, he went down and drowned at Buffalo to come back to Canada. From the States, there was a, he found out there was a, a herd of buffalo in Montana that was for sale. And because uh, the, the government had changed the regulation somehow, I don't know, the whole story. But anyway, Norman went down, he was the only white man that rode in the roundups. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, they brought them back by boxcar. And some of them came to Banff, and others went to. Uh, um, the northern part of the province, so. right. Right. but it was the seed for the for the return of the buffalo because yeah. they were down to almost nothing in this area in the 1870s yeah. when my grandfather first came. Right, right, yeah, right. Good, good. And then there were up at the Banff Springs Hotel as well as the as the Indian Days dancing and stuff. They also had Highland Games. Up yes, there. the CPR ran those for several years. Yeah. And uh, they had all the events, you know, and the Highland dancing and the bagpipes, which I grew to love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes yeah. a little <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exposure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and they had a, a lovely ceremony. Um, oh, Charles Gordon, who was a I had a pseudonym, which I can't think of right now, but he was... Uh, Ralph Connor. Ralph Connor, thank yeah. you. And he was one of the pro foremost writers in Canada at that time. And he uh, had a... Uh, he was preaching in the Canmore Church. And he came up for the Indian Days. And, in, you know, the, the fifth hole on the golf course, where it's a cauldron mm -hmm. with a, p a pond. And he said, stay on this far side of the cauldron, we'd all sit around this amphitheater, oh. natural amphitheater, and listen for this, to this talk and the bagpipes and everything. Oh, Very colorful. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that sounds like a nice place to, to grow up. Yeah. 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 Lots Beautiful. of good memories. Lots of good memories. And then in the winter, now the winter was quiet. Oh, in the winter, it was. the town just shut down. Absolutely. Yeah. When yeah. did it shut down? When? What would it? Labor Day. Labor Day was the last. They used to say you could sh shoot a, a cannon down Bap Avenue and not hit anybody. You know, <laughs> you know, once yeah. Labor Day came, yeah. and it was May twenty fourth when this opened yeah. up. Yeah. You know, that's a long winter. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, they there was a great good spirit in Banff and some really good leadership, <laughs> and. Uh, the two Brewster brothers being among them. Are, there were more than two Brewster brothers, but the two prominent ones were Jim and Bill. And uh, they uh, got together with some other, Norman Luxton being one, and uh, uh, they decided they should have some a carnival to bring people from Calgary. So uh, they 
put a lot of work into it. And we had a lot of the events just right across the street here on the river. And, you know, there'd be all kinds of uh, activities like uh, ski drawing behind a horse galloping down the river. <laughs> a little hectic, but another kind of hectic one was uh, doing a hurdle race with snowshoes on. Go, going over big <laughs> obstacles. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think there were a few bruises with some of those <laughs> events, but, but so. it was fun to watch. Yeah. And then there'd be boom ball, and then, the, you know, demonstrations of uh, figure skating by the famous um, Simpson, Simpson girls. girls. Yeah. yeah. And skating by racing with Bob and his dad, and yeah. Katie at the old rink. The old rink was, I don't know exactly the date it was built, but it was quite early on. And we had a, a little pontoon bridge across the river. It almost, was it almost straight here, wasn't it, Rob? Right, right at the end of the... <coughs> up, yeah. up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you went farther across. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. You can still see the clearing where the rink used to be, uh -huh. and it was right at the bottom of Buffalo Street. Yeah. And he used his um, boat uh, rafts, he had his canoes and, and uh, rowboats out, uh, tied up to uh, rafts, which he would then put into, make into a pontoon bridge right from the end of Buffalo Street across the river. Yeah, right, and that's how we used and, to get there. Uh, it was <coughs> before the river froze, or after the river froze, people that lived up on Cave Avenue used to come across into town. Um, they still do. <laughs> <laughs> Even maybe we, maybe sure we should safe. suggest this to the, the, the civic fathers here about a pontoon bridge <laughs> again. The, uh, the, the, the more houses built on Sulphur Mountain since that time, but uh, Cave Avenue was the East Street uh, and going up to the Upper Hot Springs, those big housing developments that are on Sulphur Mountain now Right just 20 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, no, so it was, uh, it, I remember going to hockey games in, at the rink there, and during, they always had, of course, some um, during the, the carnival, but, uh, and they also had uh, um, a ice palace made of blocks of ice, and the queen each year who was selected was crowned in a great ceremony. <laughs> and where was the ice palace? Uh, usually around the bridge, either oh, on one side. side. On the, on well, the Legion it, side? it changed. It changed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it was on the Legion side, yeah. and, and uh, sometimes it was over here. Isn't yeah. that your recollection, Rob? Yeah. They would be, the ice palace used to be as big as this house. Oh yeah, it was and, big. And uh, Charlie Beal, who was a, a very good artist here, he used to do the ice carving on them, you know, a, a buffalo out in front, or Indian heads on the side. Um, yeah, they're pretty early. There are some very interesting photographs mm -hmm. of those ice palaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they used to cut the ice from the river, just around the bend. Yeah. And uh, they'd, they'd, haul, they'd cut the ice and haul it out with a team of horses. And it would be, oh, two feet to 30 inches to 36 inches thick. That's how cold the winters used to be. Mm. And, uh, yeah, and and the winter, winters were a lot yeah. colder. And I can remember, uh, yeah, my dad used to work on that uh, ice cutting. And one day he fell in, in the middle of the winter. And by the time he got up to the Mount Royal to dry out, he was, his clothes were totally frozen. And they had to, Wait till they thought to get them off. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, anyway, but back to the Mather Rink. It was, uh, you know, just a wonderful spot. It, we always knew when it was open because they'd play Viennese waltzes 
and all of, you know, a loudspeaker, so everybody knew, yep, the rink's open, we can go over now. <laughs> yeah. So must that was been, great. Must have been beautiful to hear the, the music uh, coming across the river yeah. in the winter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 beautiful. Like, yeah. like hearing the bells from St. George's That's is right. now, yeah, all through uh, town. And in the days when the zoo was there, they, um, uh, the coyotes would really like that, and they would, <laughs> they would all tune up. <laughs> and every train that came through, the coyotes used to howl like mad, <laughs> so yeah. you knew when that yeah. was happening. Yeah. 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 Now you mentioned the Simpson sisters. Yeah. Who, who, who were they? Well, Jimmy Simpson, old Jimmy, who ran Nantucket uh, Lodge, you probably know that connection, uh, on the uh, Jasper Highway. I was one of the early uh, outfitters. He came from Scotland and uh, uh, made a career for himself. And uh, he did a lot of big game hunting and it took people out, you know, to, at the, in those days, shooting a bear or something was, or goat and sheep and whatnot, was uh, a big business. And uh, uh, he, it was either big animals or butterflies. Jim, oh. Jim, yeah, that was kind of interesting. Jimmy had a, one client that was only interested in butterflies. So he, he, he bowed to her wishes and <laughs> took her out a couple of years to study a particular butterfly. <laughs> and that was in the uh, uh, south of the province. It wasn't yeah. in the far. Yeah. yeah. But he had two, two daughters, the, yeah. the Simpson girls? Yeah, and, and one son. Okay. Uh, and the two daughters became very proficient skaters. Their mother did a lot of the instruction for them, and then they went on to Winnipeg for you know, refinement. But they wound up skating every winter at the Madison Square Gardens in New York until one of the sisters passed away and uh, that woke up the team. Mm -hmm. So, But also their son Jim was with the NHL oh, was he? in St. Louis at one point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so they're a very active family. Yeah. And of course, built Nantaja Lodge. And uh, it's still a very lovely spot to be. Yeah. So were they, were they skating on the river or at Mather's Rink? Uh, or little, both? A little bit of both. It depended on the river quality. You know, yeah. sometimes it freezes very uneven. Yeah. But, so, but they tried to do it out there whenever they could. Yeah. And, uh, so there was lots of activity like that, and they actually sent uh, trains from Calgary for this carnival. Oh, you did know, they? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it really brought a fair bit of money in, and the whole town, it was wonderful because the whole town got into it, and all the business people you know, supported it. And it was a really important community event mm -hmm. in the middle yeah. of winter. Yeah, we'd break up the long Mm -hmm. The long winter. Give you something to work for. And there wasn't much else to do except maybe drink a little rye whiskey around the fire. <laughs> a little too much of that. Uh, <laughs> there was a little bit of that, I think. Oh yeah. 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 Was, uh, but you you told me that they didn't drink uh, they didn't drink drink whiskey in the Mount Royal Hotel. They they drank the whiskey at home. The, the they drank tea in the Mount Royal Hotel. Is yeah. That right? Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, they never. I don't. They didn't serve it publicly. No. 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 No, no. Oh, gee. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah. well, and what else did they do? Curling? Curling was a big yes, sport. Yes, curling was. And yeah. it was, oh, the rink was over near the skating rink, yeah. right across the river. Right, right, yeah. right. And right. Uh, I remember going to, I didn't know if did curl, but a lot of people did. And uh, when I was a kid, my mom, used, we used to go to the hockey games, the whole family. and. Uh, it was so cold in the bleachers. And my mom used to pack my rubber boots with newspaper to insulate me against the cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And skiing. Yeah. Now well, you started I skiing did. early. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. How old were you when you put your first skis on? Nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Norquay was just beginning to open up because they were building the, the road up to Norquay in 19. 35, was I been 9? 34. 34. Yeah, 34. Anyway, um, they were building this, you know, the present loopy old trail there. But it was actually a, 
a make work project for the, the depression. And uh, when I f first time we went out, we had to walk the last quarter of the way, I guess, because the road wasn't finished yet. But uh, we were anxious to get going, so we grabbed our skis mm -hmm. and off we went. Sure. But, uh, they had a, a small cabin there then, and uh, it, uh, it was uh, a real haven because, you know, you could get, go in and get warm and get a cup of hot chocolate, which is pretty nice. But uh, it had a wonderful smell of ski wax. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, of course, there was no lifts at all. And uh, uh, the Omer Aroma, they were all Norwegian ski waxes to mm -hmm. begin with that they came over from there. And uh, it would just have that lovely pungent waxy smell. The smell of pine tar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it, when it, we'd had a big snowfall before we could ski, we had to line up everybody across the hill. Um, the main hill still is the same. It's been enlarged a bit. But, and and uh, then we'd sidestep up the hill to pack it mm -hmm. so that we could ski. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you went in, in a race early on? Oh, yeah. She's got a picture here of her with her, with her number on her, racing bib on. Yeah. 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 It, uh, they didn't have many uh, children skiing at that point. So um, we only, I had to go into the going up girls race. There were no girls, no, girls race. None so my you had age to, that were no. willing to do it at that point. So anyway, I did it and uh, I had a lot of fun with it. But the, the picture you'll see if you're interested is I look more like a snowball than, because I had this heavy mountain cloth wool suit. You know, we didn't have the new fabrics. And uh, when you fell, you, it stuck to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's kind of a fun picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And who, who, was, who, who were the skiers that you remember in those days? Oh, well, um, we had uh, kind of, a, I guess, the first ones that got involved when Rob was too young, and then he got very involved. But. Um, uh, Norman Knight and mm -hmm. uh, Herb Paris and Ted Paris mm -hmm. and uh, Cy Paris, all mm -hmm. three of them did. Mm -hmm. And um, they also did a lot of packing, you know, for tourists and stuff. And uh, uh, who? Oh, Vic Kuchera. Vic, Vic, well, yes. Vic. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 He, he came over. I th I'm pretty sure the Brewsters brought him over from Austria to teach this Arlberg technique, which is beginning to be very popular. And uh, he was a, really a quaint kind of a guy. He, he was, uh, he always wore press boards. You can pick, pick him up in the picture in a minute because he was the, well, the only one that did in those days. And uh, he, he'd have the class up on the, you know, on the Norquay Hill and you'd hear this, Benzinis, Benzinis. <laughs> he had quite an accent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they were the days. Yeah. And then, of course, we, you know, skiing really developed. And then Rob was part of a group called the Ski Runners, and um, it all, you know, Gordy Hargrid and Johnny mm -hmm. Luthwaite yeah. and. Uh, Rob and a bunch of kids, Jerry Locke, my husband, became my husband. And uh, they um, competed, and the boosters used to give them transportation to compete all the way to Seattle and all that, and all the BC area and so on, to build up the name of the Bapsky Center, you know. So Brewster yeah. Transport paid for their transport. Yeah. To get there. Yeah, to get in the morning. Yeah, that's very generous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there was the Dominion Championships, you say, were yes. a big, a big, big yeah, boost. Big, yeah, it was, because in uh, 1937, uh, they uh, bid for and got the uh, Dominion Championships. And that really put skiing on the map. And we even had a, a, um, about eight competitors from France mm. uh, at that time. So. Uh, it was big time, and uh, the only problem was that we just had our usual February thaw. Good skiing all winter, then it was icier than the Dickens, 
and our skiers didn't do very well because they weren't ski used to skiing on ice. <laughs> and you know, most resorts had a lot of ice to contend with. <laughs> so, but it was a great event and it certainly put the uh, skiing in Banff on the map. Yes, and another great event that you were telling me about, and you've got a little piece of paper here about it. Oh yeah. Um, was the first plane, the airplane, that landed just out here on the river? Did yeah. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it, it, this was in, I found in the archives at the White, which is a treasure house of stories. But um, I just thought it was so crazy <laughs> that I just had to read it for you. So this was in uh, 1930. 1929. 1929. 1929, yeah. yeah. So the first plane to land in Banff created a stir. Most had never seen one in flight. Pilot Fred McCall was a famous hero of the First World War, having shot down many enemy planes. He, he was then traveling the country doing stunts at fairs and other events. And the Count Craig carried in the Craig is so amusing, I thought it, I'd really love to have you hear it. On Saturday, January 9th, 1929, the loud hum of an airplane motor was heard for the first time in Banff. War ace Freddie McCall brought his ski-equipped Stimson Detroiter to land on the ice of the Bow River. Typical of McCall's pioneering effort, it was a risky adventure and very nearly came to grief. First, the aircraft bumped the pontoon bridge. <laughs> Quickly taking to the air again, it flew for a few more feet to touch on the ice with its tail pushed to one side. Mm -hmm. This made it begin to skid. So only through skillful piloting was it, man was it maneuvered from hitting the boathouse <laughs> <laughs> on the river. <laughs> Although the tail did catch the word walker on the building, but did no particular damage. Mm -hmm. Captain McCall and the three passengers lighted, unruffled, and victorious. <laughs> the takeoff that afternoon gave the crowd and his passengers a performance just as interesting and dangerous as was the landing. A strong breeze began to grow, and it caught the aircraft just as it left the ice and whirled it over to the right upstream bank of the river. Fortunately, this was at a point where Echo Creek empties into the Bow River, just down here. With considerable presence of mind, Captain McCall turned the plane's nose up the stream and for about 500 yards dodged trees in this narrow lane until he gained altitude. <laughs> Had it not been for the fortunate position of the creek, the plane would have in all likelihood crashed into the tree-lined bank of the Bow River. The trip back to Calgary was made in a record 38 minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, Freddie McCall was really a daredevil because uh, he, at, at the Stampede one year, he was um, flying the, the uh, two sons of the manager of the Stampede and uh, the plane started to act up. So he landed on top of the Ferris wheel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And everybody got out of it. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, That's gee. a famous story in the Freddie, Freddie McCall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for those of you who maybe don't remember, the old airport in Calgary was McCall Field. Yes. It was named oh, after him yeah. before our new modern airport in Calgary. So where we're sitting right now, of course, in the Crosby home, and in the middle of Block A, this is Block A, from the library down to here is Block A, and it was, and, and in a way to me it still is the heart of Banff. And uh, so, Ralphine, you, you were going to tell us a little bit about who lived here. Uh, yes. Maybe we could start with sure. Abigail. Abigail. Sure. Well, this beautiful old home was built, what did we decide, 1913? Yeah. Yes. And uh, it was by a man and his wife who came from Prince Edward Island. Mm. I should have you tell us, Rob. But anyway, <laughs> I'm in the driver's seat here today, I guess. You are. <laughs> So anyway, uh, it was a very happy home for the five kids. And uh, when the last ones, when Rob was the youngest, and the last to leave, I guess, home, 
but uh, Lou and his wife uh, lived in it until they passed away. But uh, they also built Deer Lodge at Lake Louise, so, and Mrs. Crosby was very busy with that. But um, the home uh, was gifted in later years to the White Museum, as, as Natalie told you earlier, and it's been empty for about 20 years. So it's really nice to see it used again. Yeah. It's a very gracious old home, yeah. a real landmark. Yeah. Then just across the street there, where that big new building is, was Jim Brewster's beautiful uh, brick house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was unfortunately destroyed uh, without... And, it's not, a, yeah, it's, not, it's not a happy story <laughs> because it was about to be declared a historic site and the night before the bulldozers came down back and the man that bought the property just tore it down. So for 30 years it sat empty and then finally the man that had bought it had the nerve to build. But it was the only house in uh, Canada that the King and Queen of England visited. Mm. They, they were, uh, Jim Brewster was chosen as the driver of them. They, it was a holiday for them. They didn't have any schedule, so they were free to ask to do what they wanted to. And one of the things they wanted to do was to see uh, uh, Jim's collections. And, uh, and uh, so they un unexpectedly, they asked to come to the house. Of course, they did, and my poor Aunt Dell was uh, in total shock, I guess. <laughs> but fortunately, she's one of those ladies that never wore a house dress. She was always dressed up. So, <laughs> so 1937. she. Yes, it was. Yeah, we had a nice uh, incident that, uh, while they were here too. Um, you know, they didn't, they, nothing was said about where they were or what they were doing, except their visit to the St. George's, actually, the church, English church here. But uh, we were in the habit of driving out on the Vermilion Lakes Road to watch the beavers. And uh, so this night, we just, while they were here, we decided to go for a drive, and uh, all of a sudden we saw the king and queen all by themselves on the high, on walking oh, along no. the road. <laughs> <laughs> we were so surprised, but of course we didn't interfere at all. We just kept quietly on our way. But and just around the next corner was the interest and the carriage, you know, and whatnot. But it was a wonderful moment. <laughs> well, Jimmy Simpson, who yeah. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And well, whereabouts uh, did he live? It, on the back side here. And I'm d not sure the exact lot, to be okay. honest. Okay. Yeah. I had, uh, Dick loaned me his, all his uh, survey papers, but I could not make head or tail of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, but I th it was on that. Yeah, know, he, he lived right next, right where the front door of the White Museum is now, right next door to uh, what, what is the library now. But that was a vacant lot in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the White family dominated that end of the, of the uh, block. And uh, they had uh, several children with houses there. And uh, of course, Dave White was a very early comer. He um, was here in the late 80s, I believe. And uh, he was, had a canoe on Lake Louise that we have a picture of. You have a, a canoe. Oh, he had a canoe on Lake Louise? Or a, a rowboat, I guess. A rowboat? Yeah, oh, did he? Oh, it would be a hand. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and uh, it says uh, D. White. Oh, really? Yeah, really? spelled I. Oh, <laughs> spelled I, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. the, the new book is coming out that explains the I-Y mm -hmm. problem. Right. And, and of course, Peter and Catherine lived next door here. Yes, yes, a very yeah. lovely home. It's the closest to Abiquit. Yeah. And uh, right beside the White building itself, it's a problem. Uh, Philip Moore's house. Uh, Pearl was a member of the Brewster family and uh, a real tomboy because she had five brothers. So <laughs> she learned to shoot and ride with the best of them. And yeah. There's some great stories about her 
doing tricks in the parade, you know, one of the town parades, standing on her head, on her horse. <laughs> but she was yeah. a real gutsy lady. <laughs> yeah. so, but the Moore House was moved there. Was it was moved it there. It was originally up on Banff Avenue. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then next door to the Moore House is Anita's, now Anita's house. That's right, and that's a historic house. Um, Anita is Rob's daughter. She's here somewhere. And uh, that was um, built for the first uh, uh, game warden in the park, who was Howard Sippold. And, you know, Sippold Flats on the way. Pardon? Fran Brewster. Yeah, but that was after. Yeah. Uh, uh, Uncle Jim brought it, bought it for Fern later on. Uh, but it's the first game warden, Howard Sippold. And his, he was, his father was one of the, but in my mind, was the great pioneers of this area. He, uh, he came from to Ontario in 1875 uh, by wagon with the McDougall family. And uh, he had lost a hand in the, in the lumber accident in Ontario, his left hand. And somebody had built him a wooden hand with a black club on it. And it was so fascinating to me, you know, to see how he managed this. And all across the country, by wagon, he brought his wife and three children and shot his share of the game that they had to eat, you know, to, to eat. And uh, he was a wonderful man, and he's about my size. And he lived to be 101. Oh, good, good, <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So yeah. to me, he's, it's, yeah. he, he retired to Banff because he had two, two daughters, granddaughters there. One of them was at Mrs. Jim Brewster. Oh, so, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, it's the Sybil family. The Sybil mm -hmm. family, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the house in the corner that Rob's in now, that was Yeah, that was Jim McLeod's. Jim McLeod's yeah. house, mm -hmm. yeah. And Jim worked for the company originally. But then he branched out on his own and uh, was actually a competitor. But that didn't make any difference with the friendship because they stayed good friends. And eventually the Brewster Company bought him out. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so this was, this was sort of the, the high rent district? Or yeah, something? right. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's still a high rent district, well, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, the river is so. Yeah, it's a pretty nice place to live. You bet it is. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Well, and then, so you were here until you were 15 yes. years old. Well, the war, the Second World War, yeah, really was hard on Banff. You know, it, uh, gas rationing came in, and you know the tourist business just really quietened down. And my dad was seconded to um, by the government, federal government, to. Uh, oversee the gas rationing for the western provinces and he had to be in Winnipeg for that. So, you know, he did what you were told in those <laughs> war days and uh, so we went to Calgary and mom inherited a house in Calgary. So, And then I spent a good part of the rest of my life in Calgary. Mm -hmm. I was just coming back here in mm. nine years ago. Mm. Mm. Right. And along the way there, you, you married and you had a yeah. couple of children, Harvey, of course, mm -hmm. who is your very well-known son. And you have a, a, a daughter. A daughter. Well in Calgary. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's a very lovely girl, we think, don't we, when they, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> when they know too well. Good. But uh, yes, and then one of the reasons I came back was I'd always kind of wanted to, but uh, just the opportunity didn't seem to open up. And it wasn't that easy to get a ch chance to move back to Banff, you know, in those days. So, um, uh, fortunately, uh, I was asked to join the Elder New Luxton Historical Foundation. So that's what I spend most of my time with right now. Mm -hmm. is that we uh, have um, three historic houses that we keep going on, on Beaver Street, and uh, we uh, have scholarships at the two Albert, largest Alberta uh, universities that we keep up, and we also uh, try to support worthwhile projects around Banff. And uh, it's a very nice way to live. I especially enjoy the um, creative short story contests. I started at the Banff School, 
when I was a kid, um, we weren't taught anything about the history. And most of the kids didn't even know the names of the mountains around. And so I thought, maybe something I'd been doing at Strathcona Tweedsbury in Calgary um, was a creative writing contest. And we didn't have a theme for that, it was open. But I thought, if I started one in Banff, and they had to get into the archives and learn about the history of Banff, wouldn't that be great? And you know, it's really worked well. <laughs> and we've had some great work out of it. And uh, we asked people around town, like tickets served on the committee to judge it. And uh, it, it has to be um, based on either the human or the natural environment they're in. And uh, it's worked so well, I'm really pleased. I had uh, one of our aldermen catch me in the grocery store yesterday mm -hmm. and told me that her son had been in the oh. entering. And what he did, it, he just loved it, doing it and going to the archives and oh, finding all this stuff yeah. up. Now there's, there's a family connection, your family connection to the archives too. With oh your, yes, through your yeah, sister. that's right, My, Mary Alice, yeah. Um, she came back to Banff in the 60s, just when uh, Peter and Catherine White were planning the uh, museum and archives. And so she was the first director. And uh, so I was, you know, in touch with Banff a lot, always. I didn't feel a stranger here. But it's awfully nice to be home. <laughs> good, good. Well, it's, it's lovely to have you here, Ralphine. And uh, it's lovely. Thank you very much for sharing your stories with with us. Uh, maybe some people have some questions. Uh, anybody got any questions they want to ask of Ralphie? Yes. Ralphie, Joan, I if you remember the, um, the toboggan run that came down. Uh, oh yes, down. oh yes, and I didn't mention them, Joan. Now, that was a big feature, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I can't quite remember the date. Uh, uh, well, they were when I was a kid. I think they had them pretty well every, every year. Every year. And I started right on uh, the street, right at the corner here. And if they got a really good ride, they started up well up on Tunnel Mountain. If they got a really good ride down, they come right down to the river here. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> They're very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Stop that about 1958, I think was the last year. I think with 1958, they stopped it for the last time. Last the carnival? No, no. The, uh, oh, oh, the toboggan. Oh, was it? Okay. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Any chance yeah. of bringing it back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, our climate wouldn't take it. They're still doing it. They're just doing it on skateboards now. That's right. <laughs> I live right on the corner there. They all go roaring back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, this, the climate has really changed. Yeah. You know, we used to have a lot of snow all winter long in Banff. And uh, now, you know, it's, uh, I, it, some years you don't even put your boots on, you know. It's just amazing, the, the change, yeah. But there... Gary, you have a question? Ralphine, do you remember the Frank Lloyd Wright designed uh, dance hall that was across uh, the Not road? a dance hall, it was a picnic shelter. Oh, it was just a It picnic. was for picnics, yeah. It was designed, it wasn't just a picnic shelter, but it was, you know, a, a fair-sized hall. Um, it would be, I would say, approximately the width of this, as I remember. And you could go in there for shelter if it was raining and so on. And uh, it was designed, uh, he didn't personally do it, but you know, his, his um, uh, Taliesin Tele West group did uh, all the planning and he supervised it. But uh, it was, it, unfortunately, the Recreation grounds has always been damp. You know, there's a lot of swampish, and I think that finally got to, to the logs and repairing it was going to cost a lot, and it was depression time. And anyway, the parks made the decision to take it down, and uh, a lot of people are not happy about that. <laughs> yes, Claire. Hi, Ralphie and Claire. Um, you mentioned that you were going to do any mountaineering or once. <laughs> Once, yes. I, my, uh, I married a bat boy, 
and um, he loved to climb. So he talked me into going up. And it was only Norway that we went up, not a big mountain. But I knew after that that it was not my game. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I didn't have the head for it, so I just quit right then. But I, I did a lot of ski mountaineering, you know, on skis. And uh, it's a whole different thing, of course. But right, and you went to the Bugaboos in the early days. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The first full year that they operated, yeah, yeah. 1966, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was a great adventure <laughs> and uh, quite a thrill. But I never went back because how much as I enjoyed it, I was thrilled to death to be there. But I had two little kids at home. And I thought, this is kind of crazy. You know, the helicopter itself, and they hadn't done any ski snow research because they weren't operating yet. And, um, you know, I thought this is not a good place for a young mama to be. <laughs> so I never did go back. My husband did, but, yeah. My uh, husband was a, a, granddaughter, a grandson of the uh, people that built, built the old Homestead Hotel in the 1906. And then another funny story there because uh, they were very much uh, 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 very moral people, and uh, uh, John Locke came to the to Banff for the treatment of the arthritis because it was a real problem for him. And he discovered there wasn't a temperance hotel in Banff. You know what a temperance hotel is? It doesn't serve liquor, <laughs> so he decided he'd build one, and that's what the homestead became. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your microphone is there. Sorry. Yeah. Good. Oh, we got another question back there. Sorry. Um, we sorry, hi Ralphie. Um, we tend to focus on a lot of the negative things that we've seen change from back in the day to now. What would you say is the greatest positive thing you've seen change from your early days to now? Well, I guess, uh, although it's not totally flawless, I think the formation of the town is, was a very significant thing. Uh, in the early days, uh, we didn't, ha the average person didn't have a lot of communication with uh, Ottawa, and uh, uh, they did have, and I think your dad was one of them, uh, our, our advisory board that they set up to work with the, with the parks. That's right. But it was far from satisfactory, depending on the superintendent, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I think that was a positive step. I'm sorry there's quite so much rampant development, but I don't think we can blame the town for that. They've tried to keep a lid on it. Great, yeah, well. I think it's been a wonderful afternoon with Ralphine. Thank you very much, Ralphine. That's fabulous.